aging is bad for you. And um, it seems like something that we ought to be able to do something about with medicine, at least in the future. So the question is, how foreseeable is that future? And of course, there's a lot of buzz about that topic at the moment. And of course, the reason why there's a buzz and the buzz is not just, you know, a very brief temporary thing, but seems to be persisting and indeed intensifying is because there's a lot of progress. You know, the, the, there are many, many signs indicating that we may be within striking distance of bringing aging under really comprehensive medical control and letting people stay healthy, truly healthy and youthful, um, however long ago they were born. You have been predicting longevity escape velocity, which is physical, biological immortality now uh, with an expected date of the early 2030s. How sure are you of that happening? Well, first of all, not the early 2030s, the late 2030s, but still the 2030s. Um, of course, I'm not sure. This is pioneering technology. So any time frame predictions have to be probabilistic. But yes, I do think that we have a 50-50 chance of getting to this thing I've called longevity escape velocity, which has a technical definition, but we don't need to get into that. It's essentially, it's what you said. Um, yeah, by, by about that time. And I've been giving these time frame predictions for about 20 years. Now, it must be said that when I started predicting this, um, I was saying like, you know, the late 2020s or, or at least, you know, around 2030. Um, but the good news is that all of this, almost all anyway, of the slippage in those time frames occurred during the first 10 years between, let's say, 2005 and 2015. By 2015, I was already saying late 2030s, and I still am. So you may ask, you know, what's changed between those two decades? And the fundamental answer is progress has sped up. And a large part of why it's sped up is because there's been more enthusiasm from the wider world and more money. Now, I do want to emphasize that even today, the increased funding for this field is very unevenly distributed. There is inevitably a lot of money going into the areas that are perceived as the lower hanging fruit, the areas where, you know, money might be made fairly soon. You know, so of course these are people who are coming in as investors more than donors. Um, secondly, um, <clears throat> it's just that some of this is just not patentable, not monetizable in a simple way, though in due course it certainly will be. But also, you know, even in academia, um, people are very much biased towards working on the low-hanging fruit so as to get more publications and get promoted and, you know, get the next grant application funded and everything. Um, so I have tended to try to compensate for that by working on the most challenging things and, you know, um, trying to just persuade people to give me the money to do stuff that otherwise will not be done, but which is absolutely vital for this field. One of your most recent studies has been on, I think it was a thousand mice, or maybe you were looking at doing it 2000. And you were testing four different areas that showed a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. One of them was rapamycin, which is has had some efficacy in, in previous results. And then there were three more as well. There was the young hematopoietic stem cells, I'm butchering that, that word, um, and then some gene therapy, and then some uh, navitoclax as well. Could you explain a bit about how those results are going? And also, what are the key areas of promise that you're seeing in 2025 in the aging space? Yeah, sure. So this experiment was indeed a thousand mice. It began in, the, in early 2023, and it concluded about six months ago. And uh, we gave mice, as you say, these four things. We had 10 different treatment groups um, getting different subsets of those four things. Um, rapamycin, as you say, is a kind of the gold standard for life extension in mice these days. Um, pe many people have done it in different ways with different um, you know, protocols, and it works. 
And we kind of know why. But for us, it's actually a kind of a, what, what a scientist would call a positive control. In other words, we don't think that it's actually going to give much benefit in long-lived species like humans. Um, but we still wanted to make sure that we were just doing the experiment well and, pro uh, and, and you know, accurately. So we included it for that reason. The other three interventions... Sorry, can I just go on to that with rapamycin? Is that, sure. is that definitive now? Uh, what, that it works in mice? Absolutely. And that it won't work very well in humans? Also, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I mean, essentially, um, to go into the details of that a little bit, um, rapamycin is what's called a calorie restriction mimetic. It essentially tricks the body into thinking that it's not getting enough food when, in fact, it is getting enough food. And um, calorie restriction mimetics, indeed, calorie restriction itself, when one is genuinely not getting enough food, um, have been shown for literally a century now to um, extend life. Yeah. But it extends life a lot more in short-lived species than in long-lived species. And we kind of understand why that is. It's all to do with the frequency of famines of different lengths in, 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 the, in the actual wild. Um, but anyway, the point is, it's not going to be the holy grail for aging. Okay. The holy grail for aging is going to be a divide-and-conquer, multi-pronged, um, attack on damage that the body accumulates, essentially preventative maintenance, removing different types of damage that the body does to itself throughout life. And so the other three interventions that we used in this study were of that nature. Uh, one of them was, as you say, um, basically young bone marrow transplant. We killed a lot of young mice and scraped out their bone marrow and um, purified out the stem cells, and then we injected those stem cells into older mice um, in such a way that some of those stem cells would, would survive long term. And uh, then the second treatment was gene therapy for, as you, as you say, it was for one gene called telomerase, which a lot of people know about. Um, it's a gene that's involved in allowing cells to continue dividing when they normally wouldn't. Um, and then the third thing was this drug, which is a type of synolytic. Thanks for watching this Beyond Tomorrow clip. If you haven't subscribed yet to our main channel, join us there for conversations that can help you thrive today and flourish tomorrow. We'll see you next time.